This is chapter three, part three, pre-class lecture. And so we learned that the lower part of the stratosphere contains the ozone layer. The ozone layer has the highest concentration of ozone than any other part of any other layer of the atmosphere. And so therefore, having a high concentration of ozone in the bottom part of the stratosphere, which we call our ozone layer, that is where dangerous UVC radiation gets absorbed by the ozone that's in the stratosphere, as well as oxygen that's in the stratosphere, and therefore prevents that dangerous UVC radiation from reaching the troposphere. And so therefore our ozone layer, it provides a natural source of protection for, uh, against harmful UVC radiation, but also against harmful UBV radiation. Ozone can be naturally destroyed by dissociation of water molecules into free radical, comp uh, sp into free radical species. And these free radical species then can go on and react with the ozone and break it down. For example, this is called a hydrogen radical. And the other is a hydroxyl or hydroxide radical. And so water dissociating into these two radicals, those radicals can go on and react with ozone. The other radical, the hydroxide radical, can also react with ozone. And so these two processes, it happens very rarely. So on a very small scale. So therefore, the drastic drop in concentration of ozone that was noticed to start happening in the 60s, it had to have been due to something else other than the breakdown of water molecules into free radicals that in turn broke down the ozone. Because this scenario happens very, very rarely on a very small scale. So therefore, there was something beyond this natural water uh, radical uh, interaction with ozone which is a natural thing. There was something beyond this natural uh, production of hydrogen and hydroxide radicals from the dissociation of water interacting with the ozone and causing it to break down. And so, This picture here shows the total column ozone concentration in Dobson units. And so in 1979, there was about 275 Dobson units of ozone 
here in this part of the planet that we know to be Antarctica. And then in 1988, there was a drastic decrease from 1979, only about 180 Dobson units. And then fast forward 10 more years to 1998, you start seeing an even further decrease to about 60 Dobson units. And then 2008, the level was about 140 Dobson units. So there had been a continuous decrease in the amount of ozone in the stratosphere over Antarctica uh, since 1979. And so this dramatic decrease that had been noticed since 88 uh, has occurred, but it does vary by year. The minimum concentration was reached in 1994, where there was only about 73 Dobson units of ozone over Antarctica. And so this next graph shows you the years on the x-axis and the minimum amount of ozone detected in Dobson units. And so 1994 was the lowest level detection, about 73 Dobson units. And you can see from 79, when it was about 200, about 194, and we saw this drastic decrease, but since 90, 98, there's been a gradual increase in the amount of ozone over Antarctica. So we can see that there has been a recovery and therefore a steady increase in the amount since that all time low of 73 was reached in 1994. And so, therefore, having to um, look at, well, what was causing this decrease in the amount of ozone, not only over Antarctica, but globally as well, it had to be something else other than natural processes. And so, what was uh, starting to be studied in the 80s were the human roles in the destruction of the ozone layer. And so the natural free radicals that form from water dissociation didn't account for the 40 year decrease from 79 uh, until uh, our present day. Uh, that 40 year steady decrease in the concentration of ozone. Scientists discovered that the culprit were chemicals that were once used in aerosol spray cans and in air conditioners as refrigerants. These chemical compounds are chlorofluorocarbons, which are also called CFCs. CFCs were a very attractive chemical alternative to be used in aerosol spray cans and as well as as refrigerants in refrigerators and air conditioners because they're non toxic, they're non flammable, they're relatively cheap and they are widely available. 
and CFC's help to therefore revolutionize the air conditioning and refrigeration industries. And especially uh, with the invention of the automobile, which later came the invention of air conditioning uh, and therefore the marriage of those two uh, industries and uh, post-World War II, especially in America, but also worldwide, the increase in the number of automobiles per household uh, also uh, caused an increased need for air conditioning. And so therefore, uh, there was an increased need for refrigerants as more and more households had electrical uh, refrigerators, uh, also homes having air conditioning units, uh, as well as automobiles. And so therefore, having a product that was widely available, that was relatively inexpensive and non-toxic and non-flammable was very attractive. And that's, uh, that's the CFCs met all of those descriptions. Previously, uh, what had been used for um, aerosol and uh, air conditioning purposes were things like gases, ammonia, uh, sulfur dioxide and methyl chloride, all of which are toxic. And so CFCs were more attractive because of its non-toxicity. Two of the more popular CFCs are Freon 11 and Freon 12. Freon 11 is trichlorofluoromethane. Trichloro, you see the three chlorine atoms, and then there's one fluorine. Dichloro, difluoro has two chlorines and two fluorines. And so that's the difference between Freon 11 and Freon 12. Freon 11 has three chlorines and one fluorine, whereas Freon 12 has two chlorines and two fluorines. So by being non-toxic as well as non-flammable, CFCs are also considered relatively inert, which means they're unreactive. Uh, they do not react when exposed to UVC radiation in the upper atmosphere. And so what ends up happening is the CFC will break apart in the atmosphere. And in breaking apart, one of the chlorine atoms that's attached to the central carbon atom in the CFC will break apart from the rest of the compound. And so in the troposphere, the CFCs are very unreactive. But when they're exposed to dangerous UVC radiation in the upper atmosphere, they are very reactive. And therefore, when they react in the upper atmosphere, in the stratosphere, for example, the chlorine atom will become dissociated from the rest of the molecule. And this chlorine becoming dissociated from the rest of the, the uh, CFC, it will form a radical species. And it's this chlorine radical then that will go on and react with the ozone and break it down. And so therefore, chlorine is used in, in an early reaction then is regenerated later and therefore it acts like a catalyst because it never gets re destroyed by reacting with ozone it gets regenerated so in that way the chlorine radical acts as a catalyst and it can keep reacting with ozone over and over and over again and continue the and therefore increase the rate of destruction of ozone exponentially while itself never getting destroyed. And so here we have Freon 12 reacting with a UV photon with a wavelength that's less than or equal to 220 nanometers. So therefore this is UVC. So what happens is the chlorine breaks off, one of the chlorines breaks off from Freon 12 creating a chlorine free radical. 
So the normal chlorine atom has seven valence electrons. But the chlorine radical only has six valence electrons. So a radical differs from the atom in that it has one less valence electron than the atom has. So the chlorine radical only has six valence electrons. And another way to write it will be just showing that there is a uh, unpaired electron, that it has one fewer valence electrons than its corresponding atom. So this chlorine free radical will then go on in reaction two to react with ozone creating another free radical and oxygen. And so the, the chlorine oxide radical can go on then and react with atomic oxygen. to produce another chlorine radical and oxygen. And so the chlorine radical that was used up in reaction two gets regenerated in step three. And so because it gets regenerated, that's how, why we can describe it as a catalyst. And acting like a catalyst, it speeds up the breakdown of ozone. So in the next graph, we see two different graphs, a red graph and a blue graph. The red graph being stratospheric chlorine, the blue graph being stratospheric ozone. So we can see that as the amount of stratospheric chlorine increases, the amount of stratospheric ozone correspondingly decreases. And both concentrations are in parts per billion, stratospheric ozone and stratospheric chlor chlorine are in parts per billion. So there is a direct correlation and well, an indirect relationship between ozone and chlorine concentrations in the atmosphere. As the amount of chlorine in the atmosphere increases, the amount of ozone in the stratosphere decreases. And this is in the stratosphere. 
Now, Antarctica, you see this phenomenon more extremely because Antarctica is in the bottom part of our planet. And therefore, it receives the least amount of sunlight than any other part of our planet. So because in Antarctica, uh, the South Pole as a whole is the coldest spot on Earth, therefore receiving the less amount of sunlight uh, per days per year. Because of that extremely cold environment, clouds called polar stratospheric clouds that should be PSCs. These polar stratospheric clouds help support chemical reactions that produce active chlorine that catalyzes ozone destruction because these polar stratospheric clouds they contain ice crystals and these ice crystals They act as kind of like a support platform. For reactions to take place. And so therefore you have this seasonal variation in what's called the ozone hole that exists over the South Pole. And so you can see that in the following graph, you have the Arctic winter versus the Antarctic winter. And the Arctic win winter is therefore going to be between the months of November, and April in general. That's our winter in the Northern Hemisphere, whereas the Antarctic winter, winter generally ranges between May and October. And then you can see here, temperature in degrees Celsius is on the Y axis. And then in Fahrenheit, on the right hand side, Y axis, the temperature in Fahrenheit on And then uh, the X axis shows you the different winters, Arctic and Antarctic. And so those polar stratospheric clouds acting as a solid uh, support platform for the reactions to take place, that means they act too like a catalyst. And therefore, these polar stratospheric clouds are able to form only in the South Pole due to needing a certain temperature in order for them to form. And so, very little polar stratospheric clouds will form over um, the Arctic zone or North Pole zone, but you have more polar stratospheric cloud formation in the South Pole because of the lower temperatures that are reached in that region versus the North Pole region. And so therefore, at about a negative 77 degrees Celsius, uh, 
which comes out to about a negative 108 degrees Fahrenheit will be the temperature at which these polar stratospheric clouds form. And so therefore, you'll have that occurring more so between the months of June and September over the South Pole. And so once it was discovered that these chlorofluoro compounds, CFCs, were responsible for the exponential decrease in the ozone concentration in the stratosphere, global cooperation between nations, they came up with the Montreal Protocol in 1987, which they resolved to phase out the production of CFCs by the year of 2010. And so those uh, resolutions were followed and CFCs are no longer produced. And so the stratospheric ozone concentrations have been increasing. They have been recovering, but recovery of ozone concentrations is a slow process. It's going to take about the year of 2070 to reach the ozone concentrations in the stratosphere that we had back in 1980. And so in this next graph on the y-axis, you have thousands of tons of CFCs. And you can see that we reached a peak of uh, CFC usage around 1987 right when the Montreal Protocol was signed, we see the highest level of CFCs in our stratosphere at over 1,200,000 tons. But then since that protocol was signed and CFCs were beginning to be phased out, of course, by 2010, the thousands of tons of CFCs that were being put up into the atmosphere went down to zero. So by 2010, we phased out the use of CFCs and no more of them were being put up into the atmosphere. And so therefore, we don't know exactly when ozone depletion started, but it was first reported in 74, when they started actually measuring and keeping up with the concentration of ozone in the stratosphere from year to year. They started collecting that data in the 60s. So in 74 is when they first reported that, hey, there's been a drastic decrease in the amount of ozone in the stratosphere. About 13 years later, globally, uh, an agreement was reached to phase out those CFCs. And so in the next graph, you see the equivalent effect of stratospheric chlorine and PPT, which is parts per trillion. That's on the order of 10 to the 12th. And so you can see that the amount of chlorine in the atmosphere peaked in Antarctica, as well as the mid latitudes around the same time in the early 90s. And so since the phasing out of the use of CFCs in 2010, the amount of stratospheric chlorine has steadily decreased, both over Antarctica as well as the mid latitudes. So with that decrease in the amount of chlorine in the stratosphere, that's going to be corresponded with a steady increase in the ozone. So the ozone concentration is recovering because the chlorine concentration is decreasing since we phased out the use of CFCs. So in phasing out the use of CFCs, we didn't stop using refrigerators or aerosol spray cans and definitely not air conditioning. And so 
what we were able to do is come up with some alternative chemicals to use to replace the CFCs. And one class of compounds that have been used are called HFCs, which are hydrofluorocarbons. And the hydrofluorocarbons do not have any chlorine atoms. They have hydrogen atoms instead of chlorine atoms. And so they prevent the release of atomic chlorine and therefore radical chlorine into the atmosphere. But the downside with HFCs is that they are greenhouse gases, which help to trap IR radiation in the atmosphere. And we'll talk about the greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect on chapter four. Another alternative to CFCs are hydrofluorolefins, HFOs. They contain a carbon-carbon double bond, making them more reactive and therefore shorten its lifetime in the atmosphere. They don't hang out in the atmosphere very long and they don't contain chlorines to uh, break down ozone. So that's what makes the hydrofluorolefins as well as the C FC's alternatives to C to um, HFC's as well as hydrofluorolefins, they're a good alternative to CFC's. So you can see Freon 12 is structure is shown here, and you can see it's got two chlorines and two fluorine atoms. However, hydrofluorolefin doesn't have any chlorines and therefore it can't form chlorine radicals that will go on and break down the ozone. Hydrofluorocarbons, the HFCs, are also alternatives because they contain hydrogens and fluorines and no chlorines. Some other similar compounds that are similar to CFCs you have HCFCs. They deplete ozone just like CFCs do, but they deplete ozone at a slower rate. Than CFCs. They still deplete ozone, but just not as fast. HCFCs still have a chlorine atom but only one. So there's a structure of a HCFC. Another type of compound that's similar to a CFC is a halon compound. They contain at least one bromine atom. And then also one chlorine atom. Now, halons, they're just as bad as CFCs. So halons deplete ozone just as fast as CFCs.
but they are good flame retardants and fire suppressants. So if there's a huge fire, like in a big office building, halons are good to use to quickly uh, put out a fire. So they're not used very often. They're used during uh, wildfires. Um, and so they're not used very often. Only in extreme fire situations would halons ever be used. Uh, their downside is that they deplete ozone, just like CFCs do. But the good thing about them is they have a good purpose. They're good fire suppressants. And therefore, in the case of a, uh, a wildfire, they can help put out the fire very quickly. So they do have a good use as a fire suppressant, and therefore they're not used very often, only in the extreme cases in which there's a large fire that needs to be suppressed. And so in our questions, the difference between an HCFC and an HFC, an HCFC It contains a chlorine atom. But an HFC doesn't have any chlorine atoms. But an HCFC contains at least one. CFCs are based on either the structure of methane or ethane. Methane is CH4, so you've got your central carbon with four hydrogens attached. And with ethane, you've got two carbons that are connected to each other. And then you've got six hydrogen atoms. Three connected to each carbon. And in question three, by substituting chlorine and fluorine atoms for all of the hydrogen atoms on a methane molecule, you make a CFC. So how many possibilities that exist and which CFC compound was most widely used? Well, since the carbon has four positions that and therefore can attach to four different atoms, you can have various possible CFCs that you can make. So you can have one chlorine, two chlorines, or three chlorines. The most widely used CFC was Freon 11. That was the most widely used one. This one here is Freon 12. And it was the next to the most widely used one, especially in air conditioning. And then question four, the following free radical compounds play a role in catalyzing reactions involved in the depletion of ozone in the stratosphere. Draw the Lewis structure for each free radical. 
And so you got your chlorine free radical. And then your NO2 free radical. NO2. would normally have 17 valence electrons, but the radical will have one fewer. So therefore you'll have a total of 16. And then our hydroxide, the OH. And the CLO. And so sunscreens can either be physical, metal-based, or chemical-based. Physical, physical sunscreens use nanoparticles that are made from metals like titanium in combination with oxygen, so titanium oxide-based or zinc oxide-based. Nanoparticles are very small. They have dimensions between 1 and 100 nanometers which are similar to the sizes of antibodies or small viruses. The nanoparticles have the ability to therefore absorb the light and prevent the light from penetrating your skin layers. So when the energy is absorbed, the electrons that are in the minerals that make up the sunscreen, those electrons are promoted from a low energy orbital into a higher energy orbital, which is called an excited state. <coughs> so they move from a lower energy level, which is called a ground state, to a higher energy level state called an excited state. The energy of the radiation has to match the energy difference between the states in order for the UV radiation to get absorbed by the nanoparticles of the solar, of the sunscreen. And so the energy difference is dependent on the composition and size of the nanoparticles that make up the sunscreen. And so whenever a photon of energy or an electron moves from the ground state to a higher energy level, which we call an excited state, a photon of light is absorbed. So this involves an absorption of energy. Remember, photons have energy. <coughs> and the energy, of course, is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the light or is equal to H times C divided by the wavelength of the light. And then the opposite, if the electron goes from an excited state back down to ground state, heat is lost. And so this is a release of energy. <coughs> 
And so chemical sunscreens that are not mineral based, that are not based on a metal like zinc or titanium, they contain organic compounds that are primarily non-metal in nature. So they may, they're made up of atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So they don't have a metal or a mineral basis. Parts of the organic chemical molecule can have alternating single and double bonds. And some of these, and that makes them uh, benzene based. And benzene is a known carcinogen. So some of chemical based sunscreens have been banned due to health or environmental concerns. And so remembering that UVA radiation has wavelengths between, between 320 and 400 nanometers. UVB radiation has wavelengths between 280 and 320 nanometers. And so you wanna make sure that whatever, whatever type of sunscreen that you're using is going to span both the UVA and UV wavelength ranges here in the green. That way you're protected from both UVA and UVB radiation. So oxybenzone, sulisobenzone, those are chemical based sunscreens that protect you against both UVA and UVB. Those shown here in red, avobenzone, uh, menthol anthranolate, so on and so forth, they only protect you from UVA. Then here shown in blue, octylmethoxycinamate, for example, and homosalate, they only protect you from UVB. So you want to make sure that whichever type of sunscreen you're using protects you from both UVA and UVB radiation. UVA radiation penetrates farther into the layers of your skin because it has a longer wavelength. UVB is higher in energy and therefore higher in frequency and therefore can actually remove electrons from your DNA molecules in your skin, but it'll only do that to the topmost layer because of its shorter wavelength. But either effect can be potentially dangerous, can cause uh, DNA mutations eventually, and puts you at a higher risk for skin cancer. Uh, so you need to be protected from both UVA and UVB. And that brings me to the end of part three of the chapter three pre-class lecture.